Hello everyone, um, I'm Harry Cliff, I'm a particle physicist uh, based at the University of Cambridge in the UK and I'm the next sort of uh, 45 minutes or so I'm going to be taking you on a, a virtual tour of CERN which is the, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, the largest particle physics lab in the world um, and talk to you a little bit about the what's going on there but sort of the focus on, on the experiments and the big machines that are hosted at CERN. So um, just to introduce the location of CERN, so here's a, here's a satellite shot of Europe. We're going to zoom in on uh, Switzerland. So here you can see uh, on the right-hand side the, the Alps, the mountains, the highest mountains in, in, in Western Europe. And then in the middle there is uh, Lake Geneva. Now the end of Lake Geneva is the city of Geneva. And then if you zoom in again, you can see this is an aerial shot taken from a, a plane showing the area around the city of Geneva. So in the, the background, you can see... Uh, the Alps and the, that highest uh, mountain there is Mont Blanc. Um, uh, the, the city of Geneva is that kind of grey smudge you can see at the end of the lake. And you can actually also see, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the uh, the airport runway, which is about here. And then uh, marked in yellow, this great big ring is uh, the root of the largest scientific instrument that's ever been built. It's called the Large Hadron Collider. And that's um, a machine that uh, CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, hosts and uh, it's the machine I'll, I'll mostly focus on as, as we sort of take our virtual trip around CERN today. Um, but before we get to the LHC, I'll, I'll first say a little bit about CERN itself. So um, this is a, a shot of the CERN laboratory, or at least uh, one at the main CERN laboratory site, which is just outside uh, Geneva in a, in a place called Meyrin. And it's a, it's a very large, sprawling facility, as you can see. And it's not just laboratories. It's kind of almost like a, a small town. It's got a lot of the things you'd expect. Uh, a town to have. It has uh, restaurants and hotels and uh, travel agencies, even post offices. Uh, but it's a town that's populated only by, well, almost exclusively by particle physicists and computer scientists and engineers. So it's a slightly strange uh, sort of community from that point of view, quite unusual. But um, but it's a place where uh, physicists from all over, from that point of view, quite unusual. But, um, but it's a place where uh, physicists from all over uh, the world gather to do large experiments that couldn't really be afforded by any one nation alone. So CERN was first uh, established in the 1950s uh, in the wake of the Second World War, and it was a way of getting European scientists originally uh, back together after the war to work on uh, research which was for peaceful purposes. So CERN, CERN's research is all aimed at kind of blue skies, uh, curiosity-driven discoveries. It's not about uh, for example, making bombs, as was done during the during the Second World War. But CERN since then has expanded and grown, and it's now really, it's not really a European lab only anymore. It's really an international lab, and it's where the world comes, uh, American scientists, Chinese scientists, Russian scientists, people from, from all over the world to do large experiments in, in particle and, and nuclear physics. So um, before I kind of uh, get into the, the details of some of the, the experiments at CERN, I just thought it'd be helpful to give you a little summary of our understanding of uh, what the world is made from, because that is really what CERN ultimately is focused on. It's about understanding matter, the stuff that makes up our world, and trying to figure out whether there are new fundamental ingredients of the universe that we haven't yet discovered, and, and trying to understand the way that these ingredients come together to, to create atoms and the structures that we that we know about. So, um, on a very, so I'll take you a very five-minute brief introduction, just so you know some of the technical terms before we get into talking about the experiments. So, this image hopefully is familiar. To experiments. So, this image hopefully is familiar to most of you. This is the periodic table of the chemical elements. So, there are a, a sort of a hundred or so of these in total, going from hydrogen uh, through to uranium in terms of the naturally occurring ones. And uh, for every element, as we all learn in school, there is a corresponding atom. So, an atom is a sort of uh, uh, a fundamental, well not a fundamental, but a, a unit of matter, and there's a different atom for every chemical element, one for hydrogen, for helium, lithium, carbon, and so on through the periodic table. And if we zoom in on an atom and look at its structure, what you, you'll see is that an atom is composed of a tiny central nucleus, which is this red blob in the middle of the, of the screen you can see there, surrounded by a cloud of of fundamental particles called electrons, which were first discovered uh, more than a century ago at the, at the start of the 19th century. Um, and the different chemical elements, um, the, what, what makes them, what gives them different chemical properties is really the number of electrons that they have orbiting around the nucleus. So if we now zoom in a bit on the nucleus, it was discovered in the 19, uh, 1920s and 30s that the nucleus of the atom itself contains smaller particles. And these are particles known as protons and neutrons. So uh, protons and neutrons are, are much heavier than electrons. They're about 2,000 times heavier. 
um, and they're bound up inside this very tiny nucleus at the, at the center of the atom. The proton is a positively charged uh, particle, positively electrically charged, and it's the positive charge of the proton that attracts the, the negative electrons as they move around the atom. And also in there, you have these neutral particles called, called neutrons, which are involved in helping to hold the nucleus together. If we zoom in even closer, so in the 1960s, uh, it was found that actually protons and neutrons themselves, which were originally thought to be uh, fundamental, indivisible particles, are actually made of even smaller things. Uh, and these smaller particles are called quarks. And uh, there are two types of quark that matter uh, in, in the universe that, well, the universe that we live in. There's the up quark, uh, which is this red triangle represented there, and the down quark, which is this blue one. So. Uh, the up quark has a positive charge of plus two thirds and the down quark has a negative charge of minus one third. So two up quarks and a down quark gives you an overall positive charge of one. So that's a proton the thing on the left. And on the right, you have two down quarks and up quark, which gives you a neutral particle, which is the neutron. So we can understand uh, the properties of the proton and neutrons from the, the, the way the quarks combine together. So all this, all the knowledge basically that we've uh, accumulated over the last uh, few centuries about the structure of matter is encapsulated in a theory uh, known as the standard model of particle physics, which is a, a rather sort of uninspiring name for probably what's one of the most brilliant ideas that human beings have ever come up with. And it's a theory that describes uh, all the particles that we've ever discovered, the particles that make up atoms, but also, as you will see, some other ones that are more exotic and also the forces that hold those particles together, allow them to into interact with each other to change uh, their properties, for example. So um, just to go through the standard model very briefly, we have the electron, which we've already talked about, this little negatively charged thing that goes around the edge of the atom, and then the up and the down quarks, which make up the, the nuclear particles uh, in the atom. And so this uh, list of particles, so these three particles really make up all the ordinary matter in the universe. So you and me, the, the planet that, that we live on, the sun, the stars, are all just up quarks, down quarks, and electrons arranged in a, in a huge variety of different forms. But that's all there really is. It's a really, really simple view of what matter uh, is ultimately composed of. Um, but to this list, we can add another particle, which is called a neutrino. And this is a sort of... Uh, a ghostly particle is often described as, and that's because it has no electrical charge, and it's because it has no electrical charge, and it's extremely light, so it has a very, very low mass. Now, there are neutrinos actually uh, produced in huge quantities by the sun. They're also made in the upper atmosphere, and there are actually uh, trillions of them passing through your body right now every second, but we're completely oblivious to them because, because they don't have an electric charge. They don't really interact. Uh, with ordinary matter very much. So we don't really notice these things, but they're all around us. They're, they're very, very abundant particles, but we don't, we don't notice them. Um, and so this, this, first, this list of four particles makes up what we call the first generation of matter. And this is the sort of most common sorts of particles in the universe. But in experiments that were done uh, looking at uh, cosmic rays, so these are particles that come from outer space. And then uh, later in collider experiments, it was discovered over the course of the second half of the 20th century, that there are actually a bunch of other particles that go along uh, with this, these original four. Um, and they're, they're strange particles in the sense that they have almost exactly the same properties as the particles I've just described to you, but they're heavier um, and they are unstable. So for example, um, the electron, which is this particle here, has a heavier version called the muon, which is 200 times more massive, but otherwise has all the, exactly the same uh, properties, the same electric charge, the same spin and so on. It behaves just like an electron, apart from the fact it's much heavier and it only lives for a very short period of time. And we don't really know why these copies of the ordinary matter particles exist. There's actually a third column as well of even heavier versions. Uh, and it's not fully understood why we have this set of 12 matter particles. Uh, and that's a problem that the physicists are still thinking about today. Um, but these, so these particles I've given you here, in orange you have what are called the quarks, so those are the, the sort of nuclear particles, and then in the blue you have particles called leptons, which don't uh, interact with what's called the strong force. This is the force that holds uh, quarks together inside uh, protons and neutrons, for example. Um, and to this we can add another column, which is a list of the uh, particles that transmit the basic forces of nature. So there are three forces in the standard model. Uh, there's the electromagnetic force, which is the force responsible for electricity, magnetism, light, uh, X-rays, radio waves, and so on. So it's probably the most familiar of the forces. 
Um, and this particle is the, the particle that transmits this force is called the photon, which is this thing here. Um, I transmit this force is called the photon, which is this thing here. Um, as I also said, there's something called the strong force, which is the force that sticks the quarks together inside protons and neutrons. The particle that does that is called the gluon, gluon, because it basically glues these things together. Neutrons. The particle that does that is called the gluon, gluon, because it basically glues these things together. And then there's some other strange particles called the Z and the W bosons, which are the particles of something called the weak nuclear force, which is a, a force that uh, allows particles to decay or change uh, from one type into another. Um, and the very last piece of this puzzle, you'll be glad to hear, I'm almost finished. And the very last piece of this puzzle, you'll be glad to hear, I'm almost finished uh, with our introduction to particle physics, is the Higgs boson. So this was a particle that was discovered uh, about eight years ago now in 2012 at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. And this is a particle that's connected to the reason why uh, the fundamental particles that make up the universe, the quarks and the electron, for example, the reason they have mass is ultimately down to this Higgs boson. Um, so this is this is really what we this is a kind of this is what we know about uh, the basic ingredients of the universe at the moment. Now, there are lots of reasons for thinking that the standard model isn't. Uh, the end of the story, that this is only an incomplete description of, of what's out there. And there are many reasons for this, but perhaps the, the, the easiest to explain is that um, from astronomy, from uh, measurements of the way that stars move in the sky and galaxies move around, there's now a huge amount of evidence that suggests that there's a, a large amount of invisible material up there in space. In fact, this stuff is uh, thought to be around five or six times uh, more abundant than uh, the ordinary matter that makes up us and the Earth and stars. So this is it's what we call dark matter. It's a, it's a form of invisible matter that doesn't uh, uh, show up in our telescopes. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't reflect light or absorb light. So it's totally invisible. Um, but it, it seems to contribute a huge fraction of the total mass of the universe. Uh, and there is no particle in the standard model that can explain what dark matter is. So we, we kind of are, are fairly sure there must be something else to add to this picture. Uh, to, to enlarge our understanding of the basic ingredients of the universe. Um, and that's what uh, CERN, uh, one of the, the sort of main objectives of the experiments at CERN is, it's to find new particles or to find particles behaving in ways that we don't expect that might help us solve some of these big problems like what dark matter is, for example. So um, let's, uh, I, and I will now briefly explain how that's done. So just the general principle um, of what a, a big uh, particle collider like the LHC is and, and what is it actually trying to do. Well, the basic idea, in some sense, particle physics is the most simple-minded kind of science you can think of doing. We want to know uh, what the world is made from. So we take uh, two particles, we smash them into each other, uh, and we see what happens. But actually, um, you may have heard the phrase uh, atom smasher used to describe particle colliders. And this kind of gives you the idea that we're breaking atoms apart uh, in order to see what they're made from. But that isn't really what the LHC does because we kind of know what atoms are made from. Actually, what the LHC does is it makes new particles out of energy. Uh, so this is this is really the, the purpose of the machine. So the basic idea is this. You have a particle, like a proton, for example, and you accelerate it to very high speeds. And when, it, and when it's going at full speed, it has a certain amount of energy, uh, which is labeled in this diagram as E. So this is the kinetic energy, the energy that's due to the fact this particle is moving very fast. And then you take another particle and you also accelerate it to very high speeds and give it energy E. And then you fire these two particles at each other. And when they collide, the energy they carry, this kinetic energy, is converted into new matter. So you're making particles out of kinetic energy. So uh, this sort of central blob represents um, a new particle that you might make. So you might be able to make a, a particle that's much, much heavier uh, than a proton, for example, if you can accelerate the protons to very high energy. So um, this, the, the, and the maximum uh, mass of the particle you can make is basically the sum of the energies of the two protons that you put in uh, divided by the speed of light squared. And the reason it's that uh, expression is because of the famous equation E equals mc squared, which Einstein famously uh, derived in the early 20th century and basically tells us that mass, matter, is really a form of energy. And that means we can turn energy into mass, into matter, and make new particles. So that's really what the LHC does. It's a machine for making matter out of energy. And the more energy uh, you, you have, the heavier the particles you can create, and therefore, hopefully, you have a better chance of discovering uh, dark matter, for example. 
So that's the, the sort of basic principle um, of what the LHC is. So let's now go and look a bit at this machine. So um, this is an aerial shot, uh, as I said, of the Geneva area. You can see marked in yellow, the LHC. Now, uh, just to say that you, if you went to CERN, you would not actually see anything on the surface because the LHC is buried 100 meters below, below the ground. Um, but you can see here there's this 27 kilometer circumference tunnel that runs uh, through the countryside. It actually crosses uh, the Swiss-French border uh, four times as it goes around. Uh, you can see that we're right on the edge of France and Switzerland here. And the way that the LHC works is, is, is really fairly easy to understand. So it's over here uh, where it says CERN, uh, that was the laboratory site I showed you earlier. Somewhere over here in the lab, there is an ordinary bottle of hydrogen gas. It's something you can just buy from an industrial supplier. Uh, the hydrogen gas is ionized. So electric uh, field is used to break the hydrogen atoms apart and you separate out the negative electrons from the positive protons. And those positive protons are then sent through a series of particle accelerators. So um, there are a bunch of accelerators on, on the main CERN site that get increasingly large and the particles go through them and every time they go through them they get faster and faster. Eventually they uh, reach this uh, machine here. So this is that you can see this uh, ring marked in blue which says SPS uh, seven kilometers. So this is a machine called the super proton synchrotron which once upon a is a machine called the super proton synchrotron which once upon a time back in the 1980s, I think, was CERN's largest and most powerful particle accelerator. So this machine's job now is really acting like a kind of a slip road uh, route to, to bring particles to the Large Hadron Collider. So the protons go round and round uh, the SBS and they're injected into the LHC. So you then have protons going uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise in two uh, counter-rotating beams uh, around the ring and they're then accelerated. As they go around the ring, they get faster and faster and faster and faster until eventually uh, they get to the high, the, the maximum energy possible, and then you bring them uh, into collision. So um, that's the that's the very basic principle of how this thing works. We're just going to zoom in a bit and focus in a bit more detail on actually how do the different elements of the machine uh, operate. So um, our, the LHC is often described as a particle accelerator, but one of the strange things about this gigantic uh, instrument is that the bit that accelerates the particles is actually relatively small. In fact, it's only about 30 meters long. So um, uh, down here where we have this little label accelerating cavities, there is a stretch of the LHC, as I said, about 30 meters long, and that is the bit that actually does the acceleration. The, the rest of the, the ring is just a tube effectively to get the particles back around again so they can be accelerated over and over again. So every time the the protons go around this ring, they go through the little accelerating section, they get a kick in energy, uh, and then they get come, they come back around again and get another kick and another kick and another kick. And that's how you get them to higher and higher speeds. Um, so we're gonna just zoom in on this accelerating area first. So if you go down into the tunnel at that little point, this is what you'll see. Uh, so you can see uh, just in front of you, there's, some, there's an engineer, I think, on, a, on one of these little uh, sort of golf buggy things that are used to get around the, the tunnel or transport equipment. Uh, and on the, on the left hand side, you can see this big thing that's sort of a big steel uh, cylinder. These are what are called accelerating cavities. So they're effectively uh, metal boxes with a very uh, high voltage, about two million volt electric field inside them. And that field that electric field is oscillating voltage about two million volt electric field inside them and that field that electric field is oscillating so it flips uh, backwards and forwards and it, as, as the particles approach it um they're they're sort of drawn towards it by the electric field which then flips and then repels them out the other side so they kind of get attracted then repelled and that's how they get kind of accelerated they get kicked in that way um, and there's a little animation here just to show how this works. So this is us zooming into that metal cylinder and you can see what's going on inside, going on inside. So you can see this kind of bell shaped uh, cavity, which is the accelerating cavity and that blue and red flickering represents the changing electric fields. So you can see the protons coming in and as they approach the cavity, they see an attractive blue field and then that flips to red, which then repels them out the other side. So they're sucked in by the attractive field and repelled out. And this is how uh, repeatedly over uh, many, many, many revolutions around the ring, the protons are accelerated to extremely high energies. And eventually, after a sort of uh, several minutes or maybe an hour of acceleration, they get up to the maximum uh, speed possible at the LHC, which is 
0.999991% of the speed of light. So, you know, a tremendously high speed. And at these very high speeds, the particles have a huge amount of energy, which means you can produce potentially uh, very heavy, exciting new particles. Um, so that's, uh, that's how the acceleration bit works. Now, as I said, the rest of the 27 kilometer ring, most of it is just there as a way to get the particles back around the ring again so they can be accelerated uh, again. Um, and the, this is actually an extremely difficult thing to do. And the reason is that the, the protons are traveling at a tremendously high uh, speeds. And that means that you need a very, very powerful force to bend them around the ring. Um, analogy may help here. If you think about, say, driving a car on a racetrack and, and you're going around a corner, well, if, you, if you're going very fast, then you need a very, uh, you need a lot of friction in the tires of the car for the car to stay on the road. Uh, there's a kind of there's a big force that's trying to push you off the edge of the track effectively and the same thing is happening here so you need very powerful uh, force to keep the protons uh, on there on the on the ring and the way this is done if you go down into the tunnel is using incredibly powerful magnets so this is uh this is a shot of the tunnel uh, the, ma the main tunnel of the lhc this is what most of the large hadron collider looks like it's uh, effectively a very 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 long blue uh, tube that curves away into the distance, 27 kilometers in length. Um, now inside, I'll just tell you a bit about what's going on inside this tube. So inside this uh, tube, uh, are, as I said, are very, very powerful magnets. And it's these magnets that uh, bend the protons around the ring. So uh, there are two types actually of magnets at the LHC, broadly speaking. Um, these things that you can see that uh, uh, the blue ones uh, are what are called dipole magnets. So these are magnets whose job is to bend the particles around the ring, to kind of bend it around the curve. And then every so often, you will also see these uh, paler colored magnets, which are actually quadrupole magnets. So these are magnets that are not used to bend the particles around the ring, but to focus the beams. This is to keep the beams of protons. Imagine these protons are flying along uh, in, in a very, very narrow beam with hundreds of billions of other protons. You want to keep that beam focused and well controlled because the more focused it is, the higher the intensity of the collisions you can create. And that's what these quadrupole magnets do. So I'll just I'll tell you a bit about the, the bending magnets because they're, they're really uh, one of the biggest challenges of building the LHC was really, uh, one of the biggest challenges of building the LHC was building these magnets. So there are over 1200 of these magnets um, each of which uh, is um, uh, 15 meters long and weighs uh, 35 tons. So they're, they're really huge and heavy things. In fact, I think it's right to say that their size basically was limited by the maximum length of trailer you can have on a European road by law, because you couldn't make them any longer than that. You wouldn't be able to get a truck that could transport them effectively. But you can see here a sort of a slice through one of these magnets. I'll just point out some of the main features. So um, here we go. So in the middle of this uh, device, you, you can see these two pipes. So there's uh, one on the right and one on the left. Uh, these are the beam pipes. So these are the pipes where the uh, proton beams actually uh, travel inside the magnets. Um, and these have to inside the magnets. Um, and these have to be incredibly empty. So you, if you had any gas or stray uh, molecules floating around inside these pipes, the protons would crash into them and that would uh, you know, degrade your beam and, and, and degrade the performance of the machine. So these uh, beam pipes have to be empty. It'd be really, really high vacuum, actually emptier than interstellar space. Um, then around those beam pipes, uh, this kind of, of these kind of copper colored little sections, these are the actual coils of the magnet. So they're made of a, a superconductor, uh, which is a material that has no electrical resistance, um, which means you can put enormous electrical currents through it. Uh, and this allows you to generate fantastically powerful magnetic fields of about 8.3 Tesla, which is what's required to keep these protons on the ring. Now, uh, the, the real challenge is that these superconducting coils that are used only work at around minus 271 degrees Celsius. So about that these superconducting coils that are used only work at around minus 271 degrees Celsius. So about 1.9 Kelvin, just a, a couple of degrees above absolute zero. Uh, so you have to chill the entire LHC down from room temperature uh, to minus 271 degrees. So that's a change in temperature of almost 300 degrees, 290 degrees or so. Uh, and the way that's done is by pumping uh, liquid helium uh, through the machines. This is liquid helium at incredibly low temperatures. It flows intravenously through the magnets and it's used to cool the machine down 
to its operating temperature. Um, and cooling the machine it introduces all kinds of problems. It, it, you know, for one, one of the most amazing things I think about facts about the LHC is that um, if you think about taking a, a piece of metal and cooling it down, um, hopefully, well, we all, I, I said, if you learn in school that when you cool a piece of metal down, it shrinks slightly. There's this uh, phenomenon known as thermal contraction, where the, the, the me bit of metal will shrink by a small amount. Well, in this case, you're, you're cooling down a piece of metal that is 27 kilometers long. Uh, and the, actually, that results in the, the whole LHC shrinking by about 30 meters in length when it's cooled. Uh, which is a, you know, a huge distance. Uh, the whole machine has to be designed to be flexible so that when it contracts as it's being cooled, it doesn't break or misalign, uh, for example. So this is one of the extraordinary engineering challenges involved in building uh, this machine. Um, and the fact that any of this works, I think, is sort of slightly miraculous, really. I'm always stunned uh, by, the, by the, the technical challenges that had to be overcome to make this, this machine work. Um, so that's the accelerator. I should also say that I'm not an engineer, so I, I'm not really involved in the, uh, the, the engineering. Well, I'm not at all involved in the engineering of the LHC. What I, I actually work on uh, is what, what are called the experiments. So these are the uh, places around the ring where the proton beams actually collide. And that's where we are looking for signs of new particles and forces, for example. Um, and there are four experiments, four big experiments at the LHC, which you can see labeled on this map. So working from uh, top to bottom, you've got LHCB uh, marked over here, which is my own experiment. This is uh, just next to the runway of Geneva Airport. You can see a little bit further around the ring is Atlas, uh, which is just opposite the main CERN site, then Alice, uh, and then on the far side of the ring is CMS. And I always feel a bit sorry for CMS because they've got a really long drive if they want to go back to CERN for lunch. Uh, if they're doing some work on the experiment. So they're, they're several kilometers away from the main CERN site. So these are four locations around the ring where the beams collide. And then uh, in, at these locations, you have these big detectors whose job is to record the collisions, to take images of these collisions, which then physicists use to search for signs of, of new particles. So just to show you what some of these experiments look like. So this is uh, uh, underground photograph again, of the CMS experiment. So this is uh, one of the four big experiments that I described to you. Uh, and it's a really kind of extraordinary looking thing. Uh, you know, it looks like something out of Stargate or something, but you can kind of get a sense, I think, of the scale of this machine. So just at the bottom of the image, it looks like something out of Stargate or something, but you can kind of get a sense, I think, of the scale of this machine. So just at the bottom of the image, uh, you can see this is a, a person in a, in a hard, in a white hard hat. So this is an enormous instrument. It's, it's about uh, 15 meters high, uh, 25 meters long, and weighs in about 14,000 tons. So it's an absolutely gigantic object. It's, um, it's shaped like a barrel. So what you're looking at here is the end of the barrel, effectively. Part of it's been pulled back so you can look inside, but you can imagine this extending off the edge of the screen uh, into the distance. The particles collide right in the middle of this barrel and, and surrounding the collision point are these concentric layers of detectors whose job is to uh, help you reconstruct the trajectories of the different particles. So this is CMS, as I said, so CMS stands for co the compact muon solenoid, which I also always think is a bit of an odd use, use of the word compact, uh, considering there's enough iron in this experiment to make two Eiffel Towers. It's really enormous thing. But actually even more enormous is Atlas. So this is the other, uh, this is on the opposite side of the ring to CMS just next to CERN. Atlas is even bigger. So Atlas is 25 meters long and 45 meters, sorry, 25 meters high and 45 meters long. So it's a huge thing. It's so big, in fact, that when you go down into the cavern where, these, where the experiment is housed, you can't really get a sense of the scale of it because you're, it's so huge and, and you're so close to it uh, that it's hard to get a wide enough shot. And you can kind of see here, uh, again, there's a guy in a hard hat for scale, but you, you, you've not even got the whole experiment in shot here because it's, it's really just sort of too big to get in the, in the frame of the camera. Um, this is uh, another one of the experiments is LHCB, which is the experiment that I work on. Um, it's not quite as big as the others, but it's still pretty large. This one's about 20 meters long, 10 meters high. So still gigantic. It's quite different looking, as you can see from the other, uh, can be large. This one's about 20 meters long, 10 meters high. So still gigantic. It's quite different looking, as you can see from the other, uh, compared to Atlas and CMS. This one, rather than being barrel shaped, is, is sort of made up of, of uh, linear layers of text that are laid out along the beam line. 
So it has a rather different form. It's also not quite as sort of sexy looking as Alice or CMS, but you know, it's still a, a very lovely experiment. And then the final one I'll show you, this is Alice. So Alice is um, uh, a specialized experiment that studies uh, a state of matter uh, that existed in the very early universe. So this is uh, in the very early universe, just you know, uh, about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Uh, the universe was so hot that uh, protons and neutrons couldn't form. Uh, so basically, this was a time in the universe where quarks, these subatomic particles that we talked about that make up protons and neutrons, were flying around freely uh, in, a, in a substance called a quark gluon plasma, which is a sort of superheated soup uh, of subatomic particles. And uh, for part of the year, the LHC uh, collides, rather than colliding protons, it collides the nuclei of lead. So lead atoms, where you strip off the electrons, you put uh, these lead ions into the accelerator, you collide them. And when they collide, you create these little blobs of this superheated liquid, effectively, this superheated quark gluon plasma. And Alice's job is to study that quark gluon plasma. You can get it in, this is a shot of the detector. You can see the liquid, effectively, this superheated quark gluon plasma. And Alice's job is to study that quark gluon plasma. You can get it in, this is a shot of the detector. You can see that the um, this big red uh, sort of door thing you can see uh, is the the uh, is actually part of the magnet which uh, Alice uh, sits inside. Again, we're going to be an extraordinary looking uh, instrument. So I'll just now explain a little bit about how these detectors work in in, in general. So each of these detectors is, is designed a little bit like an onion. So it, it has a series of layers as you working from the, the collision point in the middle as you go outwards there are different layers concentric layers of detectors which have different jobs and their jobs they, they, the idea is they all come together uh, to help you understand what happened in a, in a particular collision so this is a, a diagram that's actually a cross section through cms uh, it's quite nice for illustrating the basic idea of how these things work so on the far left hand side uh, you have the the center of cms so the collision point this is just a sec this is imagine it's a bit like taking a kind of an orange slice through the detector it actually would extend off the, the screen in all directions but so this is the middle uh, right at the edge on the left hand side so that's where the particles collide and then surrounding uh, the collision point is something called the tracking system so all all the experiments have this this is a sort of usually made up of silicon um, and it's a six have this this is a sort of usually made up of silicon um, and it's a series of layers. And as the particles, as, a, as say an electrically charged particle flies out from the collision, it will leave little electrical signals in the tracking system. And, and these little dots effectively tell you uh, where the particle went. So you can see some examples of this here. For example, uh, this track here is, an, uh, this one at the bottom is an electron. And the electron, as it moves through the track, it leaves these little crosses in each of the tracking stations and then afterwards you can then reconstruct the trajectory of the electron CR there was an electron that went there uh, and then beyond the tracking system this, these next two layers are, are part of what's called the calorimeter which is essentially a very uh, heavy dense bit of the detector whose job is to stop all the particles and absorb all their energy and usually as, those, as it does this as the particles crash into the calorimeter they give off uh, light, they give off lots of light, and you record the amount of light that's produced, and the more light, uh, the more energy the particle had. So it's a way of measuring effectively the energy of the particle. So for example here, uh, you can see, I think this is a, uh, a, a, this could, for example, could be a proton, for example. And as the proton go, goes to the tracking system, then it hits the calorimeter, and you can see this big squiggle. That represents the light that the proton gives off as it hits the, the calorimeter. Uh, this entire inner part of the detector sits inside a very powerful magnetic field. So the next thing you can see in this diagram is labeled superconducting solenoid. This is a magnet. And the job of the magnet is to bend uh, the particles as they travel. So when you put an electrically charged particle through a magnetic field, it will travel in a curve. Uh, and uh, the curve will tell you two things. The direction of the curve tells you whether the particle is positively or negatively charged. So a positively charged particle will curve in one direction, whereas a negatively charged particle will curve in the opposite direction. So for example, you can see that here, you've got an electron uh, here that's curving uh, to a uh, sort of in, in a kind of uh, anti-clockwise direction. And then the proton here, which is positively charged, which is curving in a clockwise direction. So you can immediately tell these two particles have different charges. Um, the other thing is that the 
the this the sort of the uh, uh, the strength of the curve, how bendy or how straight that curve is, tells you how fast the particle is moving effectively. Or it, strictly, it tells you the momentum of the particle, which is the, its speed multiplied by its mass. And and the higher the momentum, the higher the speed, the straighter the curve will be in general. Whereas slower moving particles will curve a lot more. They have much more uh, sort of tightly curved tracks. Sometimes they'll even spiral if they're going slowly enough. So by looking at how curved these lines are in the magnetic field, you can measure the speeds of momentum of these particles. And then the very edge of the detector, this sort of red thing in the, well, the, the bits in, inside these red boxes are what's called muon systems. And these are to detect a specific type of subatomic particle called a muon, which is the heavy version of the electron. And the reason these are here is that muons are, are sort of, because they're very heavy uh, and also um, they don't interact with a strong force, they can actually penetrate the entire detector. So a muon will break through uh, the calorimeter and go right to the edge of the detector. So if you see uh, some hits, what we, you know, some signals in these outer systems, that tells you that you had a muon uh, come through the detector. And muons are interesting because they quite often are produced in the decays of exciting particles that we would like to study. So in, that's in very broad terms how all of the detectors work on it. They all work on very similar principles. Some of them have other sorts of sub-detectors as well, but I won't go into all of that. But the basic idea is you have a tracking system in the middle that shows you where the particles went. You have a bit that measures the energy, and then at the edge you have these muon systems. And all the detectors are more or less arranged in this kind of uh, uh, form. So the, bringing all that information together uh, allows you to then create uh, an image, effectively a three-dimensional image of one of these particle collisions. And this is uh, an image of a, a, a real collision that took place, uh, so you can see from the date, actually, it was on the 25th of June in 2011, at about uh, 25 to 7 in the morning. Uh, and in 2011, at about uh, 25 to 7 in the morning. Uh, and here you can see what happens when two protons uh, collide. So two protons have collided with each other right in the middle of this image. And their energy, their kinetic energy, has been converted into new particles. So each of these tracks you can see coming out is a, is a new particle that was created from the energy of those protons smashing into each other. Um, and you get, uh, this is this is an image from CMS. Here's one from LHCB. So uh, this is, you can see over here, in, in, our, in our case, the collisions happen at the edge of the detector, and one from LHCB. So... Uh, this is, you can see over here, in, the, in, our, in our case, the collisions happen at the edge of the detector, and you can see all these tracks going through LHCB, uh, very similar to CMS, and then Atlas, uh, here's an image of an Atlas collision. So um, the job of a physicist like me is then to uh, trawl through this data in search of uh, new particles. So I'll use the discovery of the Higgs boson as, a, as an example of this. So... Uh, the first thing I should say is that these collisions take place, uh, you have 40 million uh, collisions taking place every second inside each of the experiments. That's 40 million, uh, 40 megahertz, so 40 million collisions a second. So there's a huge number of collisions, and this happens uh, for a large part of each day, usually for about sort of 20 hours uh, a day, you will have collisions going on uh, more or less seven days a week. Uh, for about nine months of the year. The LHC usually runs from uh, March, April through to just before Christmas, just around uh, late December. So you have a very, you can imagine 40 million a second all day long, all week long, almost, you know, for, for sort of three quarters of the year. So there's a huge number of collisions. And the, the job is to trawl through these collisions in search of uh, signs of new particles. So, for example, uh, the Higgs boson, which was being looked for at CERN in the early part of the, the last decade. Um, one of the ways that you, you look for the Higgs, well, the thing that's really challenging, your protons collide, and if you're very lucky, you, you make a Higgs boson. So make, the Higgs boson kind of pops into existence in the middle of your detector. But the, the Higgs is an extremely short-lived particle. So it lives for a tiny, tiny fraction, a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, some, something of that order. Um, which is far too short uh, for it to actually hit any bits of your detector. So you, you never actually see the Higgs. Instead, what you see are the things the Higgs decays into. So the Higgs will decay, it will convert into other particles. And it's those other particles that come flying out that you're actually able to detect. So this is a, an image of a, a collision from, taken by Atlas. And it shows a potential 
uh, sign of a Higgs boson. And what you can see here, these two large rectangles that are pointing out from the collision point, these are uh, high energy photons, so particles of light. Uh, and one of the ways the Higgs boson can decay is to decay into two particles of light. So you can see here, you've got two high energy particles of light, they both point back to the collision. That suggests that maybe there was a Higgs boson in the middle. So what you essentially do as a, as a physicist is you write an algorithm that in the middle. So what you essentially do as a, as a physicist is you write an algorithm that trawls through the trillions and trillions of, of collisions and looks for collisions where there are two high energy photons. And if, it, if they meet certain criteria, you then keep that data and that's then used to see if you can see any evidence of a, of a Higgs. Now, um, as I said, that there are huge numbers of collisions taking place every second, 40 million a second. And the reason for that, now, um, as I said, that there are huge numbers of collisions taking place every second, 40 million a second. And the reason for that is that a lot of the processes that we're looking for are extremely rare. So when you, you collide two protons, it's a bit like rolling a, a dice, uh, except it's a dice with sort of you know, millions of sides. And perhaps only uh, only one face of that million sided dice is the thing you're interested in. So there's a huge amount of uh, collisions which are not interesting. And you have to find a way of sifting out uh, the interesting stuff from that huge number of collisions, sort of like panning for, for gold. So um, this huge amount of data presents enormous challenge. So in total around the LHC, if you add up all the different experiments, uh, there are around a billion collisions taking place every second, which generates around a petabyte of data every second. So that's a thousand terabytes of data per second. Uh, and in a year, that's a, a stupid number. It's 10 zettabytes uh, of data in a year, which is far too large uh, to be, be recorded. So one of the first things that has to happen is that in real time, uh, on each experiment, there is something called a trigger and the trigger looks at each collision and tries to decide whether or not something interesting is likely to have happened in that collision. Um, and the trigger will then, in most cases, throw away uh, the collision or say, this collision looks boring, it's just particles we've seen before. And in you know, maybe one in 10,000 collisions, it will go, ah, this, is, um, this potentially could be interesting. It could be a Higgs boson or it could be dark matter. So this trigger system reduces the data volumes from uh, 10 zettabytes in a year down to 30 petabytes. So you only actually record around 30 petabytes. Although I say only 30 petabytes is still a very large amount of data and it presents an enormous challenge in how to handle it all. So um, the, what happens is once you, uh, the first place the data goes after it's been uh, recorded by the experiments is here. This is a photograph of the CERN, the main CERN computing center which is a large uh, computing center where many, 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 many processors run and their job is to uh, reconstruct uh, the data and also to store it. So copies of it are stored here. But actually um, the data volumes are so huge that it's not possible for a single computer center to cope with the whole LHC data sets. There's actually a system, a worldwide uh, distributed computing system called the Worldwide LHC Grid, which is a network system of computer farms uh, all over the world many of them in Europe, but also in America and China and Russia and other places. Um, and this sort of global uh, grid acts as a giant supercomputer effectively, which allows uh, LHC scientists to store and analyze the data. So you can see here, this, this diagram here is a, is a shot taken of grid activity at some on some particular day, I can't remember when it was, but um, oh, this was back in 2016. But each of these lines you can see uh, represents data packets being sent backwards and forwards across this grid in order to allow um, physicists to analyze this huge quantity of data. Um, so at the end of it all, uh, what you, you then do is once you've got your data, uh, you do your analysis. And in the case of looking for the Higgs, what was done is, as I said, you look for all of the collisions where you've got two high energy photons produced. So these are photons that could have come from the decay of a Higgs boson. And then you add up the energies of those two photons. So you, in order to work out what could have been the mass of the particle uh, that they came from. And then in the end, you sort of, this is more or less what you do, you plot it on a graph. Um, and what you can see on this graph, um, on the, on the, the uh, that they came from. And then in the end, you sort of, this is more or less what you do, you plot it on a graph. Um, and what you can see on this graph, um, on the, on the, the, the horizontal axis is the, uh, the total, uh, 
energy of the two photons, so effectively the mass of the particle that they came from, and on the vertical axis is the number of, of pairs of photons you saw. And what you can see in this graph, if you look at, at around 125, there's this bump in the graph. And that bump is the sort of smoking gun, the sign that a new particle has been discovered. Uh, and what was really convincing uh, when this uh, data was first uh, revealed in 2012 was that both ATLAS and CMS, these two big uh, experiments at CERN, they both saw a bump in the same place. And that was sort of convincing proof that a new particle, uh, which has subsequently uh, is pretty clear, is the Higgs boson, uh, had been discovered. Um, and then and then the final place we're going to go on our, our trip of CERN, tour of CERN is uh, to the main CERN auditorium. So this is the large lecture theatre at the main CERN site. And this is where a lot of presentations and, and meetings take place. Uh, but it was also on the day back in 2012 when the Higgs boson's discovery was announced. And here you can see uh, kind of people applauding some of the senior leaders of the LHC project and, and, uh, and the experiments who had just announced this big discovery. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you a sense of the, hopefully gives you a sense of the overall process and how how these experiments work. And I'll just finish by saying that um, CERN has a, a very long history. It goes back, as I said, to the 1950s. And since over that time, it's built increasingly uh, ambitious and large particle accelerators. And the basic reason for this is that the bigger the accelerator you can build, the higher the energies you can reach and the new, the, the more interesting stuff you can you can discover. And just a, a few months ago, actually, a couple of months ago, CERN announced uh, its intention to uh, build uh, the next generation collider. So this is a machine uh, that would actually dwarf the LHC. You can see a little uh, diagram of it here. The LHC is at the top, here, the 27 kilometer ring. And this is the new proposed machine at the moment known as the Future Circular Collider, which would be a hundred moment known as the Future Circular Collider which would be 100 kilometers in circumference. It's the sort of biggest machine you can really think about building in the Geneva area. It's so big that it basically fills the entire Geneva basin between the, the Alps and the, and the Jura Mountains. Uh, this is a project, if it, it does go ahead, that will take decades uh, to realize, and it's the very early stages of planning, but perhaps sometime in the 2040s or 50s, we can have another, another talk and another tour of CERN, but this time visiting this much larger machine. So uh, thank you for your attention and I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little tour of CERN. Thanks very much.